Great, okay. Right, we'll make start on the afternoon session. And our first talk in the afternoon session is by Gillian Peterson from the Max Planck Institute, or Marine Bi Microbiology in Bremen in Germany. She's going to talk about chemosynthetic symbiosis. So we've heard symbiosis mentioned briefly in quite a lot of the talks already, but we're going to hear a lot more about it in detail now. Thanks, Chris. Thank you also uh, to Chris and Sylvia for the invitation to be here today. It's quite an honour. And welcome back from the lunch break. So yes, I'll be talking about how animals have been able to tap the resources, the geological resources available in the deep sea. And if we're thinking about something that this might be a, a possibility for humanity in the future, well, the animals have been doing it for thousands of years already. So maybe we can learn something from them. Um, I think most of you are probably aware that uh, hydrothermal vents and cold seeps are ecosystems powered by chemosynthetic bacteria. And um, many of these uh, live in symbiosis in an intimate association with, with the animals at the vents. Now, I've just got a small video to show. So here's one of the vent sites we look at on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It's um, densely populated by these, by these mussels, Bathymodialis mussels. These are the mussels that are found worldwide at hydrothermal vents and cold seeps. And the, they reach such incredible um, density on the seafloor at these vent sites, at these um, tightly associated with the vents themselves. And they can reach densities that, um, are, that rival those um, in the shallow water mussel beds that we heard mentioned before, even in commercial um, mussel fish, mussel um, beds. Um, the, these mussels reach a much higher density. Here's one of our experiments on the seafloor. We were doing similar things, trying to work out the rates at which they grow. There are predators in the deep sea. Uh, they didn't manage to escape those. Uh, these guys are always very happy when we arrive on the seafloor uh, with our sampling material and crush a couple of mussels and do their work for them. But they're certainly able to crack open the mussels themselves. Um, here's some of our most sophisticated equipment, the um, <laughs> sampling net. Uh, so here's somebody sitting up on the, on the, on the ship um, in, in a van that's um, with the pilots of this, this of the ROV, and that's the ROV Quest. That's one of the um, vehicles we use quite a lot. Um, it's based in Bremen. <coughs> so. so the role that the bacteria play uh, is similar to that of the chloroplast in a plant. So whereas in the chloroplast, uh, uh, in the plant, Chloroplasts use the energy from sunlight to um, fix CO2 into biomass to feed the to feed the plant. That's called photosynthesis. And the contrast in chemosynthesis is that the um, the bacteria are using uh, um, inorganic uh, energy sources, sulfide. We've heard a lot about, and this is sometimes called the dark energy or a geofuel. And this is why it's called chemosynthesis. The bacteria use the energy in, uh, in chemical energy stored in these compounds to fix CO2 to feed their hosts. And the mussels we work with a lot are the Bathymodialis mussels, and those from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, um, also a place we like to go. Um, they have their symbionts in, do I have a pointer here? In the gill tissue, this brown tissue, this thick, very prominent organ, that's where they host these symbionts. And this particular mussel species, uh, or the species on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, generally have two types of symbionts. One is here in pink, that's the sulfur oxidizer, and the one in, shown in green is a methane oxidizer. This is a, a technique called FISH, where we can stain different types of bacteria and see them in the microscope uh, through a fluorescent signal. So the gill tissue is just packed with these symbiotic bacteria. So you can see what the what the gills ma make in, in the vo volume of the muscle, and a lot most of that biovolume uh, is based is bacterial. Here's just an image of them, uh, an electron micrograph, showing this the methanotrophs that were in green. They're the larger morphotype, and the sulfur oxidizer is a smaller morphotype. The sulfur oxidizing symbionts used reduced sulfur compounds as an electron donor or their energy source, and CO2 as a carbon source. Whereas 
the methanotrophs, the methane oxidizing bacteria, use methane as the both um, energy source or electron donor and their carbon source. And both need oxygen. So, oops, I'm sorry. 30 years after uh, the discovery events in 1977, only two energy sources had been proven to fuel chemosynthetic symbioses, and these were those I just mentioned, sulfur oxidizing, um, uh, sulf reduced sulfur compounds used by the sulfur oxidizing symbionts, and methane, which is used by the methane oxidizing symbionts. Um, but there are plenty of other compounds in vent fluids that are known to be able to power um, primary production by bacteria. One of these is hydrogen, and <coughs> hydrogen can occur in very high concentrations at some hydrothermal vents, but until recently it hadn't been shown um, to be an energy source uh, for chemosynthesis in, um, in the deep sea. I'm going to take a risk here and I'll stand up as a biologist and tell you a bit of geology. Um, so the hydrothermal vents along the mid-Atlantic ridge uh, can be found in different geological settings. They can be either found in, in basalt, which is those in, in shown in, in blue, where um, the water-rock interaction happens in, in, in uh, crustal rocks. But there's also a very special type of setting which occurs on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, um, in, which is called ultramafic hosted, where um, mantle rocks are actually the, the site of... Um, of hydrothermal circulation, so the water rock, uh, the water interacts with different types of rocks and this results in very different kinds of uh, chemicals that they find in, in the habitats of these vents. So uh, the basalt hosted uh, vents have typically low hydrogen, low hydrogen concentrations for vents, below one millimolar, but these uh, ultramafic hosted vents, like Logachev here, can have up to 19 millimolar uh, hydrogen, and this, uh, these were the highest concentrations of hydrogen ever measured in nature, and they were measured on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So there are high concentrations of hydrogen at Logachev. There are mussels with chemosynthetic symbionts, and we know that hydrogen <coughs> is potentially an even better energy source for CO2 fixation than, um, or than, than sulfide, and a better energy source than methane. So we hypothesized that uh, the symbionts at Logachev could use hydrogen as an energy source. And luckily we were part of a um, German research foundation program, a priority program to go and visit some of these sites on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. We went to Logachev every year for a couple of years with a um, bunch of biologists, geologists, um, oceanographers, and uh, really did some nice studies at these sites on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So the first um, experiment was quite simple. We went to the vents, we sampled them, we brought the, uh, the animals back on board. A scientist needs his energy source too, Beck's beer, of course, um, from Bremen. And this is Frank, who is um, my colleague, wh who worked on this project as well. So what we did was we put pieces of the muscle gill tissue where the symbionts sit. We put these into um, an airtight container we added hydrogen, a hydrogen to the headspace, and over time uh, we measured the hydrogen concentration in this headspace by gas chromatography, and this was done by Thomas Papa, also in Bremen. What we saw, we had a couple of controls. We used seawater, we used boiled gill tissue to kill all the biological activity, we used uh, a different part of the muscle called the foot that doesn't have any symbionts, and in all of these, we saw a slight decrease in hydrogen concentration, but the effect was, um, uh, was quite different in the gill tissue that had these symbiotic bacteria. They gobbled up the hydrogen. Um, we were also interested in seeing if this energy was then being used to fix CO2. Uh, is, it a source, uh, is it a source of energy for chemosynthesis? And we could show that by feeding the muscles with hydrogen and also with radio-labeled CO2. And we followed the rates of CO2 fixation with hydrogen and without, and with hydrogen they were always higher than without. And they were similar to the rates we measured when we provided sulphide to the organisms. So uh, hydrogen was being used as an energy source to fix carbon. How do bacteria use this energy in hydrogen? That, um, you don't need to worry about the biochemical details here, but in the pathway of hydrogen oxidation, there's an initial step uh, um, 
and this is catalyzed by uptake hydrogenases. And we were able to amplify the gene that encodes this uptake hydrogenase from the bathymodialis muscles. There are different groups of hydrogenases and we found that ours uh, grouped together with other um, hydrogenases that are responsible for hydrogen uptake and oxidation. At the same time, we were also doing some um, genome sequencing of the symbionts and we were able to reconstruct a fragment of one, uh, of one bacterial genome. And on this fragment, we found genes for sulfur oxidation, also found genes for CO2 fixation, and luckily, on this same fragment, we also had the genes for hydrogen oxidation. And this gave us the first clue that it was the sulfur oxidizing symbiont that, could use, that was using the hydrogen. We had a couple of uh, fancy techniques that were being developed at the Max Planck Institute in Bremen at the time. One was developing probes like the ones I showed you before to label bacteria. In this case, we were labeling a particular gene, and that gene was the hydrogen gene, the hydrogenase gene. And we showed that uh, probes labeling the sulfur oxidizer overlapped with the probe for the hydrogenase gene, but not the mapanotrope. So it was the um, sulfur oxidizing symbiont that had the hydrogenase gene. And we also used a method to stain the protein and we could show that it was actually being expressed by the bacteria. So going from the genome back to the environment, we asked ourselves what the environmental significance of hydrogen consumption by muscle symbionts could be. Based on our rate measurements for, that we'd done on board, in, in, on board incubations, we calculated that the Logachev muscles could be consuming the hydrogen at rates of about 30 micromoles per hour per gram of wet weight. What this translated to was an entire population at Logachev that could be consuming between 700 and 1700 litres of hydrogen per hour. But to really um, look at this in the environment, um, we needed tools that were, that were only, only just in development. And one of these was an in situ mass spectrometer that was developed by Pete Gugus and Scott Wankel in, at Harvard. And um, their machine was based on membrane inlet mass spectrometry, which allowed the, a mass spectrometer to work at the pressures uh, found at Logachev at 3,000 metres uh, below the sea, below sea level. But it can operate up to four and a half kilometres depth. And here's, this movie takes a while to start. But uh, here's the ISMS, in situ mass spectrometer, at work. Uh, and one, one of these, uh, at a white smoker in this case. And you could really place the inlet valve of this, of this machine right at the spot you want to measure. And it will measure um, all sorts of dissolved gases. You can me measure CO2 as well, um, H2S at the same time. So we were very lucky to have colleagues developing this instrument. And we took it with us back to Logachev, and did some measurements uh, around muscle beds. And what we saw, uh, we did measurements uh, of fluids, and these are the ones in blue, fluids that weren't um, influenced by muscles. So there are also areas where hydrothermal fluids come out of the seafloor, but there are no muscles around. And all of these red measurements come from the muscle beds directly. And what we saw when we plotted these was a difference between the measurements around the muscle beds and those where there are no muscles. And this um, was the result of hydrogen consumption that we were actually measuring then at the sea floor. Um, we also realized that this particular gene, the hydrogenase gene, is found in the genomes of symbionts from Riftia. So the very first sulfur oxidizing symbiont discovered um, can also oxidize hydrogen. And also the Rimikara shrimp from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the symbionts have this gene as well. So hydrogen use is potentially widespread in chemosynthetic symbioses and is not just found in the bathymodialis muscles. And we could also show that um, <coughs> animals from basalt hosted sites that um, theoretically don't have a lot of hydrogen available, they also have these genes and they're also able to oxidize hydrogen. And we're not sure what the ecological significance of that is yet. But this hydrogen use really is widespread. It's not just a special um, effect of the ultramafic setting. And we were very lucky to have this um, featured in a beautiful illustration um, on the cover of Nature. 
Now these mussels, as I said, are abundant members of chemosynthetic communities worldwide. They're found on vents and they're found on seeps. So if we're thinking about um, uh, combining work on vents and seeps, this is one of the great ways of doing it in our organismic-based um, strategy. We're interested in both. Um, there are at least 30 different species currently described. That number is not increasing, unfortunately, very quickly. Um, now that there's a dearth of real taxonomists <laughs> in the community, um, but there are a lot more out there based on the molecular data. And most of these um, have either sulfur and hydrogen oxidizing symbionts or methane oxidizing symbionts or they host both in a dual symbiosis. And I'd like to take you now <coughs> <coughs> to the Gulf of Mexico where there are three known species of, um, of Bathymodilus mussel, Bathymodilus hecarae, brooksi, and childressi. Uh, in the northern Gulf of Mexico, these cold seeps are very prominent. They're some of the best studied in the world. They're easily reachable from, uh, from uh, Gulf from ports in, in the USA. And uh, we see giant beds of, beds of mussels, beds of bathymodilus mussels. We see these vestimentiferin tube worms and the typical carbonates that we've seen um, in previous talks. Now, in contrast to the northern Gulf of Mexico, where there are very many sites known that have been well studied, in the southern Gulf of Mexico, there's virtually nothing known about, um, about cold seeps. And one place that was recently um, investigated was this area around Chapapoti where they have, um, based on the bathymetry, they'd identified uh, a number of mound-like structures. And when they went to look at these mound structures, they found something uh, that looked like caramel on the seafloor. It was these amazing flows of, of what we now know as asphalt. So they called this an ash, the, the Chapapoti asphalt seat. And it's a very unique system. I think there are only one or two known on Earth where these heavy hydrocarbons seeping from the seafloor, they're, they're so heavy and dense that they stay on the seafloor and form these, look, they look like lava flows, but it's actually a, so, a, a soft asphalt. And at this site, of course, they found the chemosynthetic communities of bathymodilus mussels and some tube worms as well. Now, our question for this Chapapoti site was how does this unique geochemical setting influence the biodiversity of the chemosynthetic fauna and their symbionts? There were two mussel species discovered at Chapapoti. One was uh, Bathymodilus brooksi, one, one hecarae, and these um, <coughs> were very similar. Or they were the same species as mussels that had been found in the northern Gulf of Mexico. When we looked at their symbionts <coughs> in Bathymodilus brooksi, we found this dual symbiosis with a sulfur oxidizer and a methane oxidizer in Bathymodilus hecarae. We found um, similar sulfur oxidizers and methane oxidizers. But in Bathymodilus hecarae, we also found <coughs> something that we'd never seen before in, in, our, um, in our gene libraries. And that was uh, related to bacteria called Cycloclasticus. And to make sure that this wasn't just a contaminant, we had to do the studies, we had to do the fish. So we developed a probe that would um, mark this cycloclasticus type. And we could see very clearly that it co-occurred with the, the well-known sulfur oxidizing and methane oxidizing symbionts inside the gill tissue of uh, Bathymodilus from, uh, from Chapapoti. So this wasn't just a contaminant, this is a real novel symbiont that does, uh, by looking at um, tens of different species we'd never seen before. Uh, culture, some of, um, relatives of this particular bacterium had been cultivated in the lab, and these were marine bacteria that were known to degrade polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and that's these, stru these um, cyclic structures here. <coughs> Now, interestingly, asphalt contains a lot of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And um, so we thought that perhaps this particular mussel species had taken up a novel symbiont that could feed on these aromatic compounds.
Again, there's also a pathway known for degradation of aromatic compounds. For example, here's a cultured bacterium. And the first step of breaking down these compounds is um, to add two oxygen molecules to the initial compound, to the ring structure. And this is done by an enzyme called an aromatic ring hydroxylating dioxygenase. And again, we were able um, to find this gene in the bathymodialis muscles that had the cycloclasticus related symbiont. So it looked like the symbiont of this muscle um, might even be able, might even have the genetic potential to use this energy source, the poly, uh, the PAHs. <laughs> um, you'll hear an echo now. So we did some stable isotope analyses, and yes, you are what you eat, it's true. <laughs> and um, so we looked at the um, carbon isotopic composition of muscles from this site, from Chapapodi. And in here, we, I've uh, drawn in the food sources, potential food sources, the methane for the uh, methane oxidizing bacteria, the CO2 as a carbon source for the sulfur oxidizing bacteria, and here is the signature for the other, the heavy hydrocarbons, like the, uh, the PAHs in the asphalt. And what we saw was, um, here's the values for bathymodialis brooksi that does not have the cycloclasticus symbiont, and here are the values for Bathymodialis hecarae that has the cycloclasticus, cycloclasticus symbiont. And we saw that the stable isotope values of this B hecarae had been shifted slightly towards the um, signal from the, from the hydrocarbons in the asphalt. And this may be an indication that the asphalt is actually contributing a carbon source to the muscle nutrition. Um, so I hope I've been able to show you now that uh, um, the, these intimate links between the geosphere and the biosphere are achieved by these geofuels, uh, hydrogen, methane, uh, sulfide, perhaps uh, polycyclic uh, hydrocarbons, and that animals have evolved to exploit these resources by forming intimate relationships, symbiotic partnerships with bacteria that can actually use these energy sources. So um, I'd like to thank you for your attention and to my uh, group in Bremen, the Symbiosis Department at the Max Planck Institute. Thank you. So I think we have time for a long discussion. Yes, yes. Exactly. This would have to be very, very quick because they're, they're, it's the same species that's found in the northern sites and the southern sites. And um, I also think that they're possibly not there in the environment for them to take it up, but it's, it, it's, it's, it's incredible to think that they could colonize a new environment and the same species that this environment has suddenly uh, developed a new association, has actually allowed this bacterium to invade its, its cells is, is incredible. That would happen. That would have to happen very, very fast. It could also be that they haven't been found yet in the north. There are um, uh, PAHs in the sediments in the north. The concentrations are obviously this is um, a, is, a, is a unique site at Chapapodi. There's a lot lot there, but there are there is also some evidence for PAHs in the northern site. So it might just be that we've it's been overlooked up until now, and it might be that. In the north, they're at such low abundance. These sort of these extra symbionts. There might be like in like this is known for for the um, insects that have symbionts that help to feed them. That they have primary symbionts and they have secondary symbionts. So this might be a sort of secondary symbiont that's sometimes there, sometimes not. But that so the evolutionary history may be long. It may be short. I couldn't say. That's that's what it looks like. That's what even even the even the sulfur oxidizing symbionts and methane oxidizing symbionts of these two species that co-occur are distinct. 
So they can recognise. And both have to be in the environment. These are uh, taken up from the environment by each new muscle generation. <coughs> and they can recognise one very closely related sulfuroxidizing symbiont from another one. And at the moment we have no idea how that happens. And, um, that's uh, something that we're looking at very intensely. It's something that's also interest interesting for uh, human microbiology. Um, why doesn't it, and certainly not everybody has the same bacteria in their gut and, um, and nobody knows why either. I'm probably referring to a different type of dark energy to something that you're talking about. In my sense, the dark energy refers to these geofuels produced by hydrothermalism, like hydrogen sulfide and methane, that are found in hydrothermal fluids. Sorry, the role of iron, did you say? Yeah. You're wondering about the role of iron. iron. Um, not in the muscles, but there was recently, um, uh, this has always been hypothesized for Rimicara shrimp because they have uh, ectosymbionts, in this case, bacteria that sit on, the, on, on um, little legs in their gill chamber. And they uh, are associated with a very distinct rust. So there are iron, ox um, iron oxide particles associated with these bacteria. And for the longest time, it's been hypothesized that there's an iron oxidizing symbiont on, uh, um, on these shrimp, and nobody was able to show it. And that was recently shown. Um, there's a group in, in France who did some metagenome studies on shrimp. And as part of this genome found also a fairly low abundant symbiont that um, is related to iron oxidizing bacteria. So it, there may be something on this. There may be an iron oxidizing symbiont. But it hasn't been shown. The activity hasn't been shown yet. It's based. It's an hypothesis based on what was in the genomes. I, we would have to look at the molecular fossils, I guess. <laughs> I, the, the symbionts themselves are not particularly basal or they're not particularly ancient. Um, neither are the hosts themselves and the, and the I think, or I'm putting myself on a limb here, I think the association's been... Um, Dated at 60 million years or something. It's it's not it's it's not particularly old. So there was certainly something happening before then, to, um, and I don't know if it's another uh, if there were symbioses. Uh, I don't know, but bacteria have been along around a lot longer than animals. So, and uh, I guess we'll hear about life, the possibility that life may have even evolved at hydrogen events. I don't know if we'll hear about that later. Well, they certainly are. are like they are, exactly.